Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming out to another session of the House Finance Committee. Uh, this evening, we will not be hearing a briefing from Sharon and her crew, but we will be blessed by, I think, 18 bills we've got to uh, deal with tonight. So the sooner we get started, the sooner we'll be done. Uh, Mr. Clerk, can I get a roll call, please? Sure. Chairman Abdi? Present. Vice Chair Slater? Present. Vice Chair Mazukowski? Present. Uh, Representative Vamore? Present. Okay. Representative Baginski? Present. Representative Barrows? Here. Representative Diaz? Okay. Uh, Representative Edwards? Here. Representative Hull? Here. Representative Nadone? Here. Representative O'Brien? Representative Quartucci? Representative Jero? Here. Representative Tabone? Representative Vella Wilkinson? Here. You have a quorum. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Clerk. We do have a quorum. Appreciate that. And I appreciate all of you coming out on this uh, blustery evening for the uh, warmer, warmer session that we're going to have tonight. But thanks very much for the time you take to come out every time. Um, as I always do before we get started on these committees is to make sure that we're all on the same sheet of music uh, in terms of what we're doing this evening. First, we had a roll call, uh, which uh, we, we're required to do now to make sure we get the correct um, number of people who are here. And at the end of the time, if somebody comes in that I didn't see before, I'll make an announcement they, in fact, uh, are in the building. Uh, the second thing I, I, we will do officially is we will uh, hold all bills for further study, and then I have a few remarks that I need to make after that. So can I get a, uh, a motion to hold all of these bills for so further moved, study, Chairman. please? It's been moved. It's yep. been, okay, great. It's, it's been moved by uh, Rep. Bella Wickinson to, that we hold it all, and it's been seconded by uh, Rep. Ruggiero and uh, by uh, Rep. Scott Slater. All in favor of holding the bills for study, study, please say aye. 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 Okay, thank Will you. Any roll call? Call? Oh, I'm sorry. No problem. That's right, roll call. Okay. I thought we just did the roll call. This is for the vote. Oh, vote. oh every vote. Attendance. Okay, gotcha. All right. We're learning. Chairman Abney? Uh, yes. Vice Chair Slater? Yes. Vice Chair Mazukowski? Yes. Representative Amore? Yes. Representative Baginski? Yes. Representative Barrows? Yes. Representative Diaz? Representative Edwards? Yes. Representative Hall? Representative Madone? Yes. Representative O'Brien? Representative Quartucci? Yes. Representative Ruggiero? Yes. Representative Tabone? Representative Bella Wilkinson? Yes. Okay. It passes. Okay, so thank you. So all bills are held for further study. As I say each night, and it's really critical, important, especially for people who, because of the modem that we're having to use now, for those of us uh, who are in the room and have gone through this, we kind of know what happens, but holding bills for further study does not automatically mean that that particular bill uh, has been killed and will never be heard again. Holding bills for further study simply means we're putting these bills into play because usually, almost 85% of the time, something has to be adjusted or has to be changed, so this keeps it in play for that. Um, the second thing is that in this committee at this particular time, because we're just putting bills into play, there's no floor debate like you would normally see on the floor. I get so many calls when people say, well, why didn't you debate this particular de uh, bill in your committee? Well, we do kind of sort of, but it is not the floor debate. What we're trying to do is extract information for us to use as we make the bills better. So that's, that's why I ask all of the members, if you have questions, please ask those questions, but not to each other and not in a debate way so that we can extract as much information as we can. If we, had, if we were all able to be here at the same time, we have what we call sidebars. That means if there's just a burning question that you need to have with the witness, generally that's when it comes in, uh, you would just step to the side and do that, and you can still get the information you need. Obviously, in this forum, we can't do it that way. So what we have to do is ask you to, uh, if you really have a burning question, you can, uh, you know, check in with us, with Sharon, or you can, you can certainly call the person if they're not on the phone and ask them about that. That clears up any debate that you may see back and forth. Um, the other thing is that generally we allow the sponsors 
a little more time than we do people who are uh, testifying verbally because the sponsor of the bill is responsible for that bill. And uh, so we don't really set a time limit on that person. But after we get past that, I do ask that, especially for people who call in, uh, please limit your testimony to two or three minutes. I know it's important to you, it's important to me, it's important to us, but I am gonna have to prompt you after two or three minutes to say one more minute please or something like that because we got a lot of uh, phone calls we have to get through tonight. It's more difficult when I'm not looking at you uh, face to face when you're at home uh, because I can understand you're there and you're comfortable but that is, that's giving us and it's giving the other people who are waiting to uh, make phone calls a good chance to you know, at least let us know whether you support the bill or whether you don't support the bill. That's and why. That's the real reason that we have uh, the verbal conversations. If you want to send in writing and it's a long, longer version, that's fine. We want to get your thoughts out. Um, that's called written testimony. The, the other thing is that I do ask that while we're here in, the, uh, in, in room 35, and I know we're spaced as best we can, but still we have uh, COVID regulations that we're trying to make sure that everybody's as safe and comfortable as possible. So I'd ask that if you are not talking or if you're not six feet away, even if you are, uh, please wear a mask so that we can all be comfortable in making sure that we've done the right thing. When I finish talking, I put my mask on uh, just like everybody else does. So that, that just helps us get through that. Uh, Sharon, am I forgetting any preliminary things that, uh, okay, as you can see, I depend on Sharon to help me out politically. Um, I'm sorry, uh, structurally here. Uh, yeah, politically sometimes too, she saved the day a lot for me. Uh, but I must say that we will get used to the, uh, uh, to the, uh, uh, the, the way that we have to communicate now is the best way to say it. I'll make some mistakes like we all do, but we'll get this done so that everyone uh, gets their testimony yeah. in. Okay, what I'm gonna try and do is make sure that I can uh, call the, the bills up. I have an order here, but they're in no particular order in the sense that a lot of people here are, have other committees to go to. So the members of the committee, your bills may come up last because you, I, you know, I have you trapped. You, you can't run away. Uh, but for the, the rest of you who are here, I'll try to make sure that, uh, for example, if, you, if you're a sponsor of a couple of bills and I forget, let me know so that we don't have to do you now and then wait for another five or six bills. It's a way to expedite things once we get started. There is a rhythm. So uh, with that said, the first, I think, two bills that we're going to do is going to be for my good friend, Rep. Constantino, uh, who is in the building uh, at this time. So that's going to be uh, yeah, 5791. And what's the other that he has? 5813. 5813. And he will re recall those as he come up. So uh, Rep. Constantino, you're on, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind, 5813. Uh, this bill basically, and I'll be very brief, uh, decreases the amount of registration fees um, for, uh, I'm sorry, reinstatement fees for registration or licenses that have been suspended. Um, right now, the fee for a reinstatement for a registration is $250. I'm looking to cut that to $125. And for a license, it's $150. And I'm looking to have that cut to $75. Uh, I call this uh, an equity issue bill because it basically uh, hurts uh, middle to low income uh, people. And, um, you know, I called Traffic Tribunal today and I asked how many, uh, what's it estimated, how many people are driving without registrations and or licenses? And the answer I received was thousands of people are driving without registrations and licenses in the state of Rhode Island. So I just think this would help poor people, uh, help them uh, to get their licenses and, and their registrations. That's on 5813. If I may, Mr. Speaker, 5791. Uh, this bill would authorize the Division of Motor Vehicles to issue a one-year renewal registration for leased vehicles. So if you lease a vehicle today, it's, most of them are 36 months. 
and when you're issued a registration, it's for a two-year period. So on the second half of your uh, registration, you only use a year of that. However, the department collects two years of registration fees. And what I'm asking is that, you know, on the second round, they only collect one year instead of two years. And that would end it if anybody has any questions. Yeah, does any member of the panel have any questions of the sponsors of those two bills, please? Yes, Rob, not on. Comment. It, yeah, is your mic on? Okay. I just want to say that uh, 5813, I like that bill. Um, most of the people that uh, are driving their cars unregistered and that are people that really can't afford, to, that have very little. And I think it's uh, egregious that we have to charge them $250 for that. So I just want to applaud the rep, Mr. Costantino. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody else have... Uh, have any other questions? Okay, Rep. Barrows, please. Well, um, I'd like to say to Rep. Constantino, I wish you had put this in a little while ago because they did charge me two hundred and fifty dollars. So, I appreciate this. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. He's an honest rep. Okay. Any other questions of the sponsor on any of those two bills? If not, thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Chairman. ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, next up, uh, Rep. Phillips. You have, uh, is that uh, 5214, please? And I want to double check, was it, did- I have did, 5213 and 5214. So okay. Whichever we'll, we'll, one you want first, I don't have we'll, a problem. We'll get you on, on both. I okay. just wanted to make sure, because we, we're trying to coordinate a lot of things. There were no verbal calls for that, uh, you know, no, no other uh, witnesses for Constitution. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, Rep. Phillips, you can take both your bills. Either, uh, I've got 5214 first. Okay, what, I'll do okay. 5214 first, Chairman. That's, gotcha. that's fine. Chairman, th members of the committee, thank you for hearing this bill. This is uh, like the third or fourth time I put this in, but last year we put all the bills in, and because of COVID, uh, I don't think anything went anywhere last year. So this one here is supported by the business community. Both of these actually are supported heavily by the business community. This first one here, 5214, is more towards the smaller businesses that are going. We are charging them a $10 fee. They have to fill out an application, a $10 fee, so they can have the privilege and the right to collect the sales tax for the state. They, think, they don't mind having to fill out the form to say they're registered and are collecting the sales tax for the state. But it just seems like they keep on, all the small businesses I talk to at least, say that you guys are trying to nickel and dime us to death. You know, $10 here, $20 here, $50 here. If they said it would be easier if we just did a complete one time saying $500 for the whole year for all your licenses and registrations and everything else. But I said, I want to just eliminate it. We just, we only collect approximately $300,000 a year out of a $10 billion budget. And it's just an aggravation for these businesses to, p to pay that $10, to write a separate check for $10 to the state of Rhode Island, so along with their application, so they can collect the sales tax. So this is what it is. I do have a, a letter that was sent to me from uh, Nina Savage from the, the tax administrator that has some questions and concerns about other app applicable sections of the law that we may have to work with on this bill. And I am going to be working with her or her designee, whoever she wants to designate to work with me, and we will hash out a sub A so that it would be more palatable. She is not weighing in either in the positive or the negative on it. She just has concerns and has some suggestions to uh, make the bill a little bit better. And with that, I will answer any questions on that one. Does anybody have any questions on that particular bill for uh, Rep. Phillips? Okay, sir, please proceed to your next bill. Thank you, Chairman. The second bill, H-5213, again, this one is a pro, very pro-business bill. Um, I was on the phone last night after a meeting with uh, one of the heads of a business organization in the state, 
and they were they're going to be submitting written testimony in favor of this bill what this bill does in essence and I will try to read it this act would change the rate of interest for underpayments of tax to prime rate plus six percent it would also limit the assessment of interest to four year four calendar years prior to the date of which notice of the delinquent payment is sent so what this does is right now we're charging penalty and interest the interest is 18 percent interest which is the highest in the country we are so far out of line on this it is not even funny. The average, according to one um, business or, uh, association in the state here, that they did the research on, I did not, is approximately 7% for interest on the money that is owed. That, that's those states, all the states combined the average. And we're at 18%. We have started to change it. It started out at like 5% in 1971 that we were charging penalty, uh, interest on. Then it went up to 20% in another year, then down to 15, then up to, right now we're up to 18. So in order for everybody to understand it and be able to calculate it a little bit easier, instead of having them haphazardly or randomly saying, we're gonna charge 21% next year, or we're gonna charge 12% next year because all the interest rates have come down. We haven't come down and the interest rates have been low for years, but we're still charging the 18%. So I wanted to make it easy for people to calculate. So prime is, let's say, 3% right now. You add the 6%, you have a 9% tax. And pe the businesses can understand that a little bit more readily and can pro hopefully budget for it so they can take care of the delinquency and that instead of being a burden and charging them 18%. Now, if you go with the rules of 72, which is a financial way of trying to calculate interest rates and how your money will double if you have put money in the bank, this will, their, the payment that they owe the state will double in between four and five years. So if you owe $3,000 within between four and five years, if you don't pay it, it's now $6,000. Then it's then $12,000 another four to five years. It just gets to be so exorbitant that we're not gonna attract businesses into the state. We're gonna have people fold up and still owe the money because they're gonna dissolve the companies. So it just makes sense to try and work with the businesses, keep them here, get them to be more profitable, and we can go from there. With that, I'll take any questions that might come up. Thank you, Rep. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah, Rep. Barrows, please. Thank you, Chairman. So, Rep. Phillip, does that, you know, do you have a, an approximate sort of um, fiscal note in terms of what this might potentially mean for? Well, it depends on, what, we, we can't calculate right now what we're going to be getting in each year for, from penalties. So we uh, we have to just wait you know they they randomly audit businesses to make sure they're in compliance and they're all their calculations if they made a simple addition or subtraction error we don't know so we don't we can approximate and i'll talk to miss savage about that she's also got recommendations for this bill also but um and she again she's not weighing in either in the positive sense or the negative sense on the bill itself but she has suggestions but we, can, we don't know from year to year what we're going to be getting in in penalties or interest rates and that because they don't know who. One year we might have nobody that um, owes the, the state money for delinquent taxes and that. Hard to understand, but we might. Or we might have a million dollars or $50 million come in. It, it depends on who they do audit and how they, how they scrutinize the auditing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Did you satisfy your answer? You sure? <laughs> uh, okay. Good. He's thinking. Hey, he's thinking. I know. I, I don't know whether that's good or bad. Rep. Zero, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Rep. Phillips, thank you for putting this bill in. Uh, and to your point, 18% uh, for the state to charge on small businesses um, for being delinquent just seems usury, especially since it's not even been consistent from 15% to 18%. And I want to commend you, too, for tying it to at least prime so there is some consistency going forward. That's the one thing business needs. They need to know consistently how things are going to impact them. Mm -hmm. I don't even think businesses mind having to pay. They just need to know what am I going to pay, how it's going to impact my business. So thank you for that, and um, I appreciate it. Thank you, Chairman. You're quite welcome. Uh, 
Yes, Rep. Nardone, please. Um, yes, I, I also want to thank uh, Rep. Phillips for putting both these bills in. They're both great bills. And I just want to tell you a, a quick story about a constituent in my uh, district whose business, he had, he had gotten ill. He was sick. He was uh, ill for about a month, a month and a half. And he incurred all these uh, back taxes, which uh, in front, all these uh, interest rates and all the... Uh, the fees, fines, and everything that came with it, and he cannot get above water. And I'm trying to navigate him through the system now, and uh, it's very difficult because also what happened to him is because he's not compliant with his taxes, he can't get a letter of good standing from the um, uh, Division of Taxation, which meant he was not able to get any of the uh, PPP loans. So it really was a double whammy for him. So there's a uh, far-reaching effects to these uh, these uh, onerous taxes and fines and um, interest rates. And I, I don't think it should be about whether the money goes into the general fund, what we're losing there. I think it should be about what's fair for small businesses. And um, like uh, Rep. Phillips said, I think 9% is very reasonable. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. Any other questions uh, for uh, Rep. Phillips? And the last comment I would okay. like to make, if you don't mind, Chairman, is that if any year is the year to try and institute these policies, it's this year where we're already upside down and inside out because of what we've been going through for the pandemic for the last year. We might as well help this, the small businesses and, and help them through from now on because they've been devastated. Every industry, every business that I know of have been devastated in the last year and this is just giving us some sense of hope and saying that we down here as the legislature are listening to them and finally hearing them more than we have in the past to be honest with you so i appreciate you hearing these two bills and i look forward to uh any further discussions that we may have thank you chairman okay thank you very much uh okay if there are no further questions oh, i'm sorry Oh, I'm, that's right. We do have two callers. I am so sorry. Okay. Oh, I'm in real trouble. Yeah, this uh, this Melissa. Travis. Melissa Travis. Yes. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, and I I didn't mean to not call you. Uh, we're trying to we're trying to learn to navigate all of this equipment. So you and and I think Dave is out there too. So welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much, and good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Melissa Travis. I am the president and CEO of the Rhode Island Society of CPAs and Rhode Island Business Forum. I have also submitted formal written testimony, but I felt so strongly about this that I wanted to call and, and just give you a, a couple of words. I promise to keep this brief. Uh, we are here to formally express our support for this legislation, HB 5213, because of the change to the interest for underpayments of tax to prime plus six. Uh, and, and Mr. F uh, Rep. Phillips did a fantastic job of explaining this. And as he stated, the penalty rate in Rhode Island is the highest in the United States at 18%, with an average of seven. So meaning even if we pass this legislation, we're still going to be among the highest, uh, but this would still be uh, really, really helpful. The issue has been discussed for years. It has been one of the biggest issues that is brought to my desk on a weekly basis because it, the hardship that it's causing to the impacted businesses and working families of the state of Rhode Island. Uh, the Division of Taxation performs death audits, correspondence audits each year. They involve thousands of businesses and individual taxpayers. And although you have a right to appeal, appeal any of these um, audits, Many choose to borrow from family or banks instead because the outstanding tax doubles, as Rep. Phillips noted, Rep. Phillips noted every five years. So at a compounded rate of 18%, and remember this is retroactive, the penalty rate in many cases is higher than the original tax owed two or three times higher. I also want to address the fiscal note impact. One of the things I would urge you to consider is when a business chooses to close, uh, and we're seeing a lot more of this during COVID, because they are so far underwater with these penalties, 
think of the impact that's going to have on the economy, the jobs, the people that are now out of work. Uh, it has a ripple effect that we, need, we, we cannot underestimate. This is 30% of the businesses, as far as we can tell, that are impacted, that it becomes so outrageous they just can't pay this. And remember, penalties are assessed for something as simple as a misclassification, a misunderstanding, or other issue highlighted during an audit. Uh, we have issues over the past few years that have brought uh, from funeral urns versus caskets, taxable, non-taxable, sales tax, restaurant tax. I know the hospitality is going to put in a, a bill supporting this bill. We've seen it in every single industry. Manufacturing, you park a forklift on the other side of the dock. Was that taxable? Is it taxed differently? Uh, and again, as someone also stated, the illness during COVID, illness is one of the key reasons we're seeing a lot of these um, past due taxes. Uh, RISPA and our members strongly urge to support the proposal. Also, the Rhode Island Business Coalition, Rhode Island Industry Alliance, for whom I serve as an officer, also submitted formal written testimony. I would like to thank Representative Phillips and all of the members of this committee that work so hard. And I also noted in our testimony, we welcome the opportunity to work with each of you to create sound tax and fiscal policy for businesses and working families in the state. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Thank you for your consideration. And we are very grateful for your leadership during these extraordinary times. Thank you so much, Melissa. We appreciate your testimony tonight. Hope all goes well Thank with you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Okay. Next up, I believe is my good friend Dave Chenevert. Dave, are you out there? Yes, I'm here. How are you doing, young man? Good, Jim. And how are you? Doing pretty good. Hanging in. We're ready for you. All righty. Uh, call in regards to uh, H5213, which is an act relating to taxation. Uh, this is a situation where manufacturers and other businesses uh, have a situation where their CPA, for example, will classify equipment or uh, information that they have, and we find back from the division taxation that they disagree. So we have one interpretation versus another. While this is going on, the taxation, the tax that was due is being held up, and it's actually getting compounded at the rate of 18%, which ends up sometimes that the uh, amount of money owed uh, is two or three times more than what the original tax was. So we're trying to put this more in line with other states. Other states are averaging around 7% uh, of an uh, interest tax, and we're trying to get this down to prime plus 4% and over a four-year calendar so it doesn't get uh, exorbitant out of the way. And the reason for this right now is, as everyone knows, this has been a tough uh, one year for every business in the state of Rhode Island, and not just us, but nationwide. And the uh, fact that most businesses are still applying for PPP uh, is a great opportunity to address a serious concern and cost to these individual businesses by lowering this interest tax uh, to down to a reasonable amount. Uh, we're not saying to get rid of it. We're just saying we, we are leading the nation in this, and I don't think that's what we want to do. So we're giving our support to this bill, and we're urging the committee to really give it some due consideration. And I am set as far as that goes. The letter explains itself. Um, and I just think uh, hopefully someday we'll be able to do this in person again. Thank you for your testimony, Dave. I hope so, too. I, I miss the good uh, camaraderie and friendship that everyone in the association has. So thank you very much for all you do for Rhode Island. Uh, I do see that you uh, gave a letter of support and also Sarah Bradko did uh, also. Any other Thank questions you. from anybody else um, that we may have missed? Okay, if not, then that will end the hearing on Bill uh, 5213. Thank you, for, thank you for your time. Okay, I'm gonna go to a Zoom uh, call before we get back to those who are here. And that is bill number 5803. Uh, by Rep. Lombardi. Are you there, sir? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, can you hear me? I can hear you and see you. Okay, <laughs> well, it's too bad. <laughs> uh, take your glasses off because I'm not much to look at, sir, but thank you anyway. I appreciate that. Anyway, this this is a house cleaning, uh, housekeeping kind of bill which uh, several accounts and actuaries have asked me to uh, uh, submit, and what this does is the uh, revenue estimating conference, the principles of that shall meet within uh, the first 10 days of April rather than May and the first 10 days of November of each year. And the primary purpose of regular scheduled conferences is to prepare economic forecasts 
at forecast revenue estimates and, and review current revenue collections under current tax law. Uh, of course, the conference principals can agree, however, to address special legislation and special topics. Uh, again, with you know, with COVID and you know, obviously the testimony from the earlier bills. I mean, it's so important that uh, stay on top of uh, you know where our monies are. We need to be accountable. Uh, our constituents, the taxpayers, are asking us to be accountable. And uh, again, this is just a housekeeping measure that uh, several accounts and actuaries have asked me uh, to propose. It. That's why I'm proposing it. Um, and that's it, Mr. Chair. They said I was going to be less than a minute, and I think I uh, met my, uh, my keeping my word. You did. You did great, uh, Your Honor. Okay. Are there any questions of uh, Rep. Lombardi on on his bill, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I appreciate it. Thank you. And I don't think we had any um, witnesses either written or uh, on the on the tube. So thank you very much for that. So that will uh, then end the hearing on Rep. Lombardi's bill. Uh, 5803. Uh, the next bill we will hear will be uh, 5458 by uh, Rep. Donovan. I think she's here somewhere. She's in the hallway. Okay, we're going to get her. Okay. And for the record, uh, Rep. Tabone is here. We'll get the clerk. Welcome, Rep. Donovan. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Uh, she, Rep. Diaz has what? Okay. Rep. Diaz, I can see you on WebEx. You have a question? Oh, I, okay. I see. We're recognizing that Rep. Diaz is here via WebEx and voted in affirmative. You, your spirit is here, uh, Rep. Diaz. <laughs> Okay, Rep. Donovan, set? ready? Okay. All right, am I, I'm on, okay. Thank you, Chairman Abney and members of the committee uh, for the opportunity to present this bill. H5458 is an act relating to taxation, historic preservation tax credits 2013. This act would repeal the sunset provision which ends historic tax credits by June 30th, 2021 or upon the exhaustion of the maximum, maximum, <laughs> maximum aggregate credits, whichever comes first. According to Grow Smart Rhode Island, the state historic tax credit has proven to be a tremendous economic and community development tool. It has stimulated 1.8 billion of private investment in Rhode Island and is associated with the rehabilitation of over 300 historic properties. I'd like to thank all the advocates of this bill and especially the Grow Smart Board. I understand that the Rhode Island builders um, are opposed to this bill because it has no assurance of providing the living or prevailing wage on projects. And I encourage the advocates um, to have that conversation so we can uh, move forward with this bill. I could take any questions if you have any. Thank you, Rep. Donovan. Are there any questions of uh, Rep. Donovan at this point? Okay. I think on the line we have uh, Scott Wolf. Hi, Scott. How are you doing? Oh, good. Chairman Abney? Yes. Yes. Thank you uh, very much. Is it my turn to it make is your remark? Yes, it's your turn for your remarks. And remember, we're going like two or three minutes uh, on these yes, remarks sir. so we can get everybody in. But you're up. So thank you very much. And uh, thanks. thank all the members of the committee. appreciate your being nimble and adapting so well to these challenging circumstances. Uh, uh, I have submitted some written testimony. I won't go through it all. I want to thank all of you for, many of you have been strong past supporters of the State Historic Tax Credit Program. I think the legislation before you today is an easy call and a prudent move. Um, uh, keeping the State Historic Tax Credit Program in play based on all of its proven success is is, I, I think, a, a slam dunk. It's especially important now, though, as we're trying to pivot um, forward from the, the, the pandemic and the recession, uh, because the state historic tax credits, the biggest impact is in our main streets and our downtown. And uh, 
those are places where a lot of our small businesses that have been struggling are located and where we really need to uh, prioritize revitalization at this point in the state's evolution. Uh, there is no uh, short-term cost to support this measure, but there could be a cost in not supporting it, that being that uh, if there are uh, committed tax credits that stay on the table that, that aren't uh, used by existing, um, existing uh, enrollees in the program, those credits could be recycled to people on the historic tax credit waiting list if the program continues, but they can't be recycled if the program does not continue. So I think that's a practical short-term consideration in addition to the, the long, knowing about the longer-term benefits of this, uh, of this program. So uh, those are, that in essence is the message I wanted to convey. I'm happy to answer any questions and thank you all for doing such great uh, work on behalf of the state of Rhode Island. Thank you, Scott, and thank you for the work that you do for the state of Rhode Island also. Any questions uh, from the panel? Yes, uh, Reverend Giro, please. Thank you, Chairman. Scott, welcome. Thank you. Nice to see you or actually hear you again. Um, well, likewise, and thanks for all your long-term support of this important program. Absolutely. It's a great program. So my understanding is uh, if we you know, deliver the sunset, we're not putting any money into the program, but can you just share again how many projects we could lose and, and how many millions of dollars that would probably impact our economy and our recovery should we not extend this, correct? Yes, right. Well, there are, there are at, at last, last time I was able to get a specific data from the Rhode Island Division of Taxation, there were 36 different discrete projects on the State Historic Tax Credit waiting list. And those projects were proposing a uh, investment in the state of a, a quarter of a billion, that's a B, quarter mm -hmm. of a billion dollars. Uh, now, not all of them would ne necessarily come to fruition, but even if half of them came to fruition. That is more than chump change and more than a chump investment <laughs> by a long shot for the state of Rhode Island. So it would be very imprudent to, uh, to not allow the, uh, the opportunity for these projects to, to go forward in the future. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Any other questions uh, for Scott? Uh, okay, in, in support, uh, Scott did give us a, a written support. So did Christine West. Uh, J. Paul Lother, Cliff Wood, Brent Ryan, David Salvatore, and Jean Cola uh, gave us information uh, written. So thank you for that testimony too. If there are no further questions, then that will end the uh, hearing on Bill 5458. Thank you very much, Rep. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, the next bill we will hear will come from Rep. Speakman. She's here. Thank you. Take your time and get settled in, and whenever you're ready, we're ready for your bill. I'm ready to go. Thank you. Oh, you're ready to go. Yeah. Okay. She's prepared, <laughs> as <Thanks>. always. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. This is Bill 5526. I bring it to you at the request of the Economic Development Officer of the Town of Warren, one of the communities that I represent. Um, he told me a story when he asked me to consider putting in this legislation a business that was, uh, had outgrown its quarters in Bristol. Uh, which is the community next door, was looking for bigger, um, bigger quarters and they found them in Warren and they found them in Fall River. And Fall River offered a tax incentive and Warren could not because of a provision in um, state law. So he asked me to bring before you and our colleagues in the chamber and the General Assembly this provision, which adds language to the statute in state law regarding the conditions under which municipalities can grant tax stabilization agreements and exemptions for manufacturing, commerce, and residential projects. Current law prohibits communities from granting tax relief to businesses relocating from one community in Rhode Island to another. And that makes sense. We don't want, we don't want uh, one town stealing businesses from another by offering them sweet tax deals. So this would set up a procedure whereby if, say, Warren had, had a facility that the, the business that had grown, outgrown its facility in Bristol could use. It would apply to the Commerce Corporation and explain the conditions and then Commerce would take a look and make sure that in fact 
Warren was not undermining, which they never would do, of course, undermining a business mm -hmm. in Bristol with a sweet tax deal. And if Commerce found that, in fact, the conditions were as I just described and that there was an incentive offered from another state, then Commerce could grant the authority to the municipality to offer a tax exemption to the business that needed to relocate. And that is that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, any questions of the sponsor, please? Okay, uh, I think we have on the phone for this particular one, Randall Rose, and you're opposed. Is that correct, Randall? Okay. We lost communication, but we are re-communicating with the person who wants to speak. Dr. Rose? Dr. Rose, you're on now? Yes. Okay, great. We're ready for your brief comment, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. and members of the committee. Um, I am in support of this bill. Um, the drug prices are getting more and more unaffordable um, and causing many problems for um, people who have medical conditions. Oh. I realize. What's that? Sorry. Yeah, uh, Dr. Rose, I think you're on the wrong bill. Uh, this is Bill uh, 5526. I see. I'm sorry. I'm, I, my apologies. That's okay. Um, okay. So thanks. Um, let's see. Um, okay. The um, yes. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So we are on Bill five five two six, and um, I just want to say sorry. This is um, that is the tax break bill. Um, I am opposed to this bill, um, and um, I um, and sorry. I, got calls from two different committees. I am opposed to this bill, um, and um, the, there, we are giving out far too many tax breaks to companies that don't need it. If a company is simply moving from one part of Rhode Island to another, they don't, that, they shouldn't get a tax break for that. Um, we already have, we're already giving out too many tax breaks to, um, to companies um, that threaten to move, even if they don't move. Um, and um, if, the, um, if a company is simply moving from one town in Rhode Island to another, um, we shouldn't have one town in Rhode Island rewarding the company for the move um, when it's going to harm another town in Rhode Island. Um, I know the bill says that um, the Rhode Island Commerce Corporation has to um, uh, Say that the um, that the company that's moving from one part of Rhode Island to another um, could have moved elsewhere, yeah. but I don't trust the Rhode Island Commerce Corporation to make that determination. Um, the Commerce Corporation exists to give out corporate welfare. I've never seen the Commerce Corporation oppose any corporate welfare scheme, even the ones that are very bad badly designed, um, so I don't trust it to make that determination. I don't trust it, the Commerce Corporation, when they claim that um, a company um, that moves from Rhode Island, one part of Rhode Island to another um, could move out of state. Um, so um, I think that we should not be paying companies just to make a move from one place in Rhode Island to another because there's no net benefit for the state. So for those reasons, I oppose the bill. Thank you. Thank you, for your, thank you for your testimony, sir. I appreciate that. Uh, okay, are there any other questions of the sponsor for this or not? Okay, then, in fact, that will. Oh, I do have uh, Robert Ruley is in support, gave us written testimony. And by the way, the written testimony that we get, it is on our finance committee's online portion. So remember that. Everyone who sends in written testimony, uh, it is online, and you can re-see it if you want to, or others can... Uh, can, can see it also. Okay, so if that's the case, then the House Bill 5526. Oh, I'm sorry. Rep. Quachochi, uh, did you did you have something on uh, Bill 5526, sir? No, sir. I just wanted to be marked as president. That's all. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Yeah. Rep. Rep. Quachochi is here, has been here. He's just uh, doing it remotely. That's all. Okay, thank you. So that ends the hearing on Bill 5526. Thank you. Okay.
Okay, then the next bill we'll hear from my good friend, Rep. Place, uh, 5316, I believe, sir. You're on. Five three one six is what I have for you. All right. So, Mr. Chairman, I actually have two bills before you. Uh, okay. Five, th five three one six. I have three people, two people that are testifying that I know of on the bill, and then one additional that's on the list. I don't know if you want me to go with the testimony or the non-testimony, because I also have I believe five eight one zero that's also on your agenda for tonight. Oh, okay. Let's go with. Um, we'll figure that out. Let's go with five three one six first. Okay. Not a problem, Mr. Chairman. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, 5316 is in essence an interstate compact uh, that is voluntarily entered into by states and only applies when you actually enter the compact. And that compact states that we're just not going to try to poach other companies' businesses or um, offer incentives to lure companies into the state of Rhode Island. That is only if the other state or they're located in another state that they have uh, already entered in the compact themselves. This came out of a, uh, an example between Missouri and Kansas. They had, um, they got a pretty big Kansas City metro area and they had a couple of businesses that would uh, just, just play them back and forth, just back and forth. And finally they decided just, just to, to, to declare a ceasefire and just stop trying to, to race to the bottom and give away as much as possible. Um, again, um, I've got two experts that are coming in to testify on this, and they can speak more clearly to the, the statistics on this. But in essence, it's an interstate compact, voluntary in entered into upon, by the state, that just says that if you're in the compact too, we're not going to compete with you and try to give taxpayer money away to try to lure some business here. And again, I've got two, two folks that are going to testify that I know of that uh, will be, probably be able to give you a better idea of the statistics on that. Okay, on, on that bill, I've got, just to make sure we got the same uh, witness list, uh, uh, Pat Gar Gar Garofala, is that one person? Okay, and then the other one uh, in support is Randall Rose, and then there is uh, Michael Farron. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Rose wasn't one of, the, one of the folks that I have come right, to testify, okay. but Randall was on the list. Yes, those are the three, Mr. Chairman, that I'm aware of. Okay, but the, but the top two, uh, Pat and Michael, are the ones that, okay. Great. Okay, good. And then, uh, just to get ahead of ourselves a little bit, um, American Liberties is in support, and uh, McCartis, the McCart McCartis uh, Center is neutral. Is that? Okay, great. So, um, Pat, we'll go with you first. Mr. Are, are, Chair, Mr. the Mercatus can't actually necessarily come in because they're a nonpartisan institute. They can't come in and say yes or no, this is good or bad or endorse. They can only provide factual information as they understand it on legislation. Understood. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Pat, is that you? Yes. Hello, Chairman. Hi. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Uh, not too bad. Uh, you're, you're here in support of a great person's bill, so let's, let's get a couple of minutes of your testimony down. Yeah, Chairman Abney and members of the committee, thank you so much for listening to my testimony today, and thank you to Rep. Place for introducing this bill. My name is Pat Garofalo, and I'm Director of State and Local Policy at the American Economic Liberties Project, a think tank dedicated to reducing corporate power and promoting democratic accountability in economic policy. I strongly support H5316, forming an interstate compact with like-minded states to abandon decades of race-to-the-bottom corporate incentives will help save Rhode Island taxpayers money, it will level the playing field for your small businesses, and it will allow elected officials to focus state resources on the policies that boost overall economic growth across the state and quality of life for Rhode Island residents. Right now, states across the country spend tens of billions of dollars on company-specific incentives annually. Rhode Island has spent more than half a billion dollars on such incentives, most of that since 2011. According to the vast bulk of the research done in this policy area, that money is buying you next to nothing as corporate incentives have a negligible effect on economic growth, job creation, or incomes. You're all engaged in a competition with other states that absent intervention will last forever and for which there will never be any winner. There are several reasons why that is the case, but one of the most important is that the vast majority of the time, incentives don't actually entice corporate leaders to do anything they wouldn't have done anyway. That's because location decisions are based on several other business factors that you all work on all the time, such as workforce requirements, supply chains, access to transportation, and other local laws. According to Tim Bartik of the Upjohn Institute, between 75 and 98% of corporate incentives have literally no bearing on where a firm ultimately chooses to locate. 
So that means, at best, influences, incentives are influencing location decisions one quarter of the time. Every other incentive given out is quite simply wasted taxpayer money. So why do these things persist, not just in Rhode Island, but across the whole country? Because there's a prisoner's dilemma here. No office holder, and I'm sure you all know this, wants to appear to be doing nothing for their constituents while those in the next state over are announcing deal after deal, even if the promised benefits of those deals don't actually materialize. Research has actually shown that governors' use of corporate incentives increases during the years in which they are up for re-election because there is political capital to be gained by employing incentives, even if actual capital doesn't follow in their wake. The Incentive Compact aims to solve this issue by having states multilaterally disarm together. The compact can short-circuit the political attractiveness of incentives and in the long term let you all work on more impactful, equitable, cost-effective economic policies that focus on your own Rhode Island small businesses and the concrete needs of communities. Because the compact's terms only apply to other compact states, there's no danger of Rhode Island having to go it alone. And this also protects Rhode Island from other states attempting to come in and post your companies, subjecting you to what is essentially economic policy blackmail. Much like the concern raised a little bit earlier in this hearing about towns within Rhode Island not wanting to be put in the, same, in the position of competing against each other for a corporate relocation. This would take that same principle and apply it to states. Now, instituting the ceasefire was a good idea before the current pandemic, but it's an even better one now. As I'm sure you all know, the pandemic is crushing state budgets and disproportionately harming small businesses, while corporate incentives provide little return for taxpayers and disproportionately go to larger companies. At the American Economic Liberties Project, we've seen an uptick in interest in incentive reform since the pandemic for that very reason. With at least 10 other states, including most of your neighbors, having introduced versions of the same legislation, the moment is now to begin to make the compact a reality. Thank you so much for your time, and I've submitted longer written, written testimony if members are interested. Thank you so much for your work, Pat. We really appreciate the information you've given us. Uh, okay. Anytime. Thank you. <clears throat> You're welcome. Uh, Michael Ferrin. Mike? Hi, Mike. How are you doing? I'm doing well, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much for testifying for us tonight, sir. We're ready for your brief comment, sir. Very good. Good evening, Chair Abney, Vice Chair Slater, and Marshall Kowski, and members of the House Finance Committee. My name is Michael Farron, and my research at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University focuses on evaluating government efforts to foster economic development. Thank you for the opportunity to provide written and oral testimony today. My remarks will run about two and a half minutes. My testimony will illustrate why economic development subsidies remain a problem despite growing agreement that they should be phased out and how an interstate compact offers an opportunity for a cooperative solution. In summary, the estimated $95 billion that states and cities spend every year on economic development subsidies is a problem because it doesn't work. First, the academic research consistently finds that governments that use subsidies don't show a measurable increase in their economic indicators of widespread well-being. Why is that? Because there's trade-offs. Every subsidy dollar has to be paid for with an extra dollar of taxation or by a dollar of deferred spending elsewhere. These trade-offs have their own long-term negative economic impacts, which can reduce or even exceed the stimulating effect of the subsidy. Secondly, subsidies don't actually sway corporate location or expansion decisions. A summary of the academic research that finds that nearly 90% of subsidies fail in their primary purpose, getting companies to change their mind about where to locate or expand. In other words, these subsidies are a complete waste of money. So given this evidence, why don't policymakers just stop offering subsidies? It's because subsidies create what economists call a prisoner's dilemma. No policymaker wants to be seen as unilaterally disarming and wants to become an interstate arms race. So they feel compelled to go along with the status quo, even if they prefer to dedicate government funding to other programs or to provide broad-based tax cuts. The good news is that Nobel Prize winning research has shown that an interstate compact like that created in House Bill 5316 offers a way out of this mess. Anything that policymakers can do to improve the $95 billion misspent on state and city subsidies every year is a move toward really improving economic growth. Thank you very much. Thank you for your great research and, uh, your, and your good report. I appreciate that. Any questions of the uh, sponsor or of the witnesses? 
If not, then that will end the, uh, the hearing on uh, 5316. Uh, okay, you have another bill, sir. Oh, I'm sorry, I, oh, my, my fault, yeah, we got in twice. Randall? Okay. Okay, Randall, I'm sorry, I have Randall on my mind. You, you're on now, young man. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the Finance Committee. Um, I am also in support of this bill. It's, um, it, it's a very good bill, and let, um, let me just explain um, uh, some things that haven't been mentioned yet. Um, the, the bill is um, trying to fight the, um, the bad practice we have where, um, where state governments um, spend a lot of taxpayer money um, on companies that have no loyalty to a state and um, move back and forth, um, hoping that their state will somehow win out. But when every other state is doing the same thing, um, it doesn't end up being a net benefit for Rhode Island. Um, it ends up just being a um, transfer from the taxpaying public um, to um, companies that um, are um, who two companies that have no loyalty to the state and um, would have probably made the same decision even without the taxpayer subsidy. Um, so it's, um, it's good to have an agreement between states to, to phase this out. Now, um, it's, um, it may seem like this is a, um, a, um, too big of a step to take, but actually it's quite, um, it, this, passing this bill will do absolutely no harm to Rhode Island. Um, this, the bill doesn't cover all the different kinds of taxpayer subsidies and incentives. It only covers one very minor specific kind of subsidy, um, which is the a poaching subsidy, a, a subsidy um, designed for one specific company to move to the state. Um, that's not how most of our um, corporate incentives work. Um, this is, this um, bill only covers um, the kind of um, the kind of measure that um, is designed to aid one specific company in moving to the state, and it says that Rhode Island will not use that kind of um, company-specific subsidy if the other states um, do not use it as well, and it only applies um, to moves within moves between states that have signed this compact. So um, what, we, what happens is if Rhode Island and New Jersey both sign the compact, okay. then Rhode Island will, will agree not to give a company-specific subsidy to, move, to encourage moves from New Jersey, and New Jersey will agree not to do a company-specific subsidy to encourage moves from Rhode Island. Um, all, that's the only situation it applies to. It will not um, affect... Um, it will not affect the subsidies we have to encourage companies to move from states that have not signed the con compact. It only applies among the states that have signed the compact. So it's a very um, so this is very limited in its effect, um, but it still saves the state money um, because within because if Rhode Island and New Jersey agree not to poach companies from each other in that way, then we've saved taxpayer subsidies. Um, and um, we've gotten out of this, um, the um, zero-sum fight between Rhode Island and New Jersey, over um, which doesn't bring any net benefit to the state. Um, so it's a good bill. Um, it takes one step towards ending corporate giveaways, and it takes and the step it takes is a pretty painless one. And it's uh, the bill um, does say that. Um, it encourages further study of how to um, extend the compact further, um, so so as to um, um, so as to extend in future um, extending the compact to um, have mutual agreements between states to not do other kinds of subsidies, um, but. Um, None of that is bind. None of that is binding language. Um, the, the bill talks about um, studying extending um, the compact further, but it doesn't require that. Um, 
all that's required in the bill that's um, before you today is to agree um, not to, um, not to have company specific subsidies to incur that will um, not to have company specific subsidies for um, moves between say Rhode Island and New Jersey if New Jersey also signs the compact. So I think this is a good bill. It's painless um, and it's popular across all parts of the political spectrum, as you can see from the people who've um, been sponsoring it, testifying for it. And um, I think this is a bill that will be applauded. And um, it, um, as has been said, it's not going to lead to any bad economic consequences for Rhode Island. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, Dr. Rose, as usual. Okay. Uh, any other questions of the sponsor of this particular bill? If not, then that will truly end the hearing on Bill 5316. Thank you very much for that. And you have another bill uh, replaced, I believe? Yes. Uh, you want to put into play? Correct, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I believe it's 5810. I had, uh, to, I had manually written it down. It's 5810. On You're correct. Right. Thank you. Um, not necessarily simple, but it's simple to explain. I know uh, for the budgeting process, it's not simple, but. In essence, what it would do would phase in over a five-year period uh, the state agencies conducting a zero-based budgeting process, um, starting off with the the, tw the top the bottom 20 percent the bottom 20 percent of the budgets uh, in agencies, and over five years, every year, you know, another 20 percent, another 20 percent until after five years, all the agencies within the state government are in essence doing zero-based bu budgeting. And zero-based budgeting, simply put, is instead of just coming to this committee every year and saying we want to increase our budget by 2%, 3%, or 25%, whatever it may be, they actually have to come to you and say, this is, this is why we actually need the money from the janitor who is sweeping the floors and the, the trash bags that we need, all the way up to, say, the, any, any other you know, employment you know, uh, requirements they have in terms of their contracts. Um, if it's you know any other agency, they have to start from zero and explain to you every step of the way why it is every penny's needed within their agency. And it's in my mind, it's it's a difficult thing for the agencies to get used to. But once they start doing it, it it does provide this committee with a better insight into where the taxpayer dollars are going every single year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I do understand uh, zero-based budgeting, <laughs> believe me. Okay, any questions of the sponsor of that particular bill? I don't see that there's anyone on phone or other written testimony. So thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. So that will end uh, the, the hearing uh, on Bill 5810. Okay, thank you very much. So the next two up, so you can be ready, uh, we're going to go to... Uh, Rep. Amore, who is uh, remote, and his bill is 5805, and then we'll move down to 5806 from Rep. Shanley. So, Rep. Amore, welcome aboard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, this bill is uh, submitted on behalf of the Attorney General's office, and I believe Ryan Holt is here to testify to explain uh, more, but uh, briefly. Um, it would take 30% of any settlement from a multi-state initiative uh, and transfer that into a restricted uh, receipt account under the Attorney General's uh, control. If that were to surpass $1.5 million, uh, the excess amount would be transferred back into the general fund. Uh, Ryan, I'm sure, will explain the, uh, the reasoning behind this uh, and the, the possible uses of that, of that money. So... Uh, I would suggest that any questions would go to uh, Ryan, who I believe is ready to testify. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. That's a good shift of questions from you to the experts, huh? <laughs> been around a while, Chairman. I <laughs> you have me too. I feel your pain. Uh, okay. Um, I think we're trying to get Ryan uh, on the line. Ryan, we have you on the line. Are you here to support Rep. Amore? Mr. Chairman, yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. He needs it now. He just admitted it, so you're on, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure he could have done it all by himself. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's, uh, it's great to be back, even virtually, before House Finance. 
uh, this evening. Uh, once again, this is Ryan Holt, the Director of Legislative Affairs for Attorney General Morona, uh, testifying in support of the AG's Bill 5805, of which we appreciate uh, Rep. Amore for introducing on our behalf once again. Um, as I have mentioned uh, to this committee before, uh, the AG's office is essentially the state's law firm. And the, uh, you know, one of our very, very critical missions uh, in the civil division of our, of our law firm uh, is participating in numerous uh, multi-state litigation efforts. Uh, these are generally uh, efforts that we join with other attorneys general's offices around the country. Uh, and they generally involve large multinational corporations. So this is not uh, something that is, is used against, generally against like small businesses, things like that. Think, you know, previously we have done uh, suits against Equifax, Johnson & Johnson, uh, Wells Fargo, uh, and the like. But these are instances where uh, Rhode Islanders have been wronged. Uh, either, you know, financially, a uh, consumer protection issue, uh, some type of environmental protection issue, health care, quite a few different things. So it allows us not only to seek you know, financial damages on behalf of the state and its residents, um, but also accountability for these, for these corporate actors. Uh, and by, by statute, that money uh, generally goes to the general fund. Uh, our, our office currently is able to keep up to ten per, up to ten percent uh, a year, up to sixty five thousand um, dollars, and that money can be used. Uh, and we've successfully petitioned the General Assembly in years past to expand the use of that uh, to pay for costs associated with, with uh, these litigation efforts. But I'd imagine uh, that that you all could imagine that sixty five thousand dollars when we're talking about cases involving large multinational corporations. Uh, and millions of dollars um, at stake, not just for our state, but for other states, uh, $65,000 doesn't quite go uh, as far as we'd like it to. And I'll tell you a little bit about why, because with, with, uh, with more of an investment and more of an effort here, we, we can do more on behalf of the state. So when, when these multi-state litigation efforts occur, there are a few different ways for a state to participate. Uh, generally, there are participating states, which is the lowest level of participation, executive committee states, and lead committee states. So generally, we, uh, due to our resource constraints, um, are, are, are a participating state in most of these efforts, which means we, we obviously support where we can, sign on towards the end, and, and collect our settlement based on our population and, and the efforts that the office puts in. But the executive committee in the lead states are the states that take on a larger share of the effort. So they can subpoena documents, they can review documents, and they help even negotiate the settlement. Um, and that's also important because, you know, the, the terms of the settlement can also help uh, determine how this money is used. Um, think, you know, if, if there's an environmental-related settlement, a lot of that money can go towards environmental cleanup. Um, and some of you may be thinking, well, you know, Rhode Island is a small state, so, you know, participating state is, is generally most appropriate. However, in a lot of settlements, even small states, uh, relatively small states, can join on as either lead or executive committee states. I'll give you um, a recent example from 2019, the, the Equifax settlement, where the state was able to recover around a million dollars, which is good. And, and, and that's, you know, that, that's positive. Uh, but Vermont, uh, a state uh, slightly, you know, about the same size as I think a little smaller in population, uh, was on the executive committee. Uh, and as a result, they were able to almost collect double of the uh, uh, amount of settlement uh, that, that we did. And, you know, Rhode Island had about half a million consumers that were impacted uh, whereas Vermont had about half of that. Um, and then to take it even a step further, uh, the District of Columbia uh, was a lead state in that effort, and they were able to double uh, what Vermont took in. 
uh, but with a similar amount of consumers impacted. But kind of the broad strengths of that, both of those, uh, you know, D.C. not a state, but also has an AG's office and is effectively a state for these efforts. Uh, D.C. and Vermont, similar size of the bus population, but, you know, in, were, was able to invest more more time, effort, and in, in people into this case and was able to collect uh, more for their residents as a result. Um, so as such, you know, we believe uh, this is a revenue-positive proposal. Uh, which not only would allow our office a better chance to collect revenue, but also, again, seek accountability and right wrongs on behalf of our residents. Uh, the money left over, there was a question about this uh, two years ago when we, were, when we had initially proposed this. And the reason why that's there is it allows us, in the event that you have a slower than regular year, to kind of still fund efforts for, for experts or for, um, you know, temporary staff to help with, with document review and, and the like to help advance those efforts. So that way we can continue on with our operations without coming to you all to ask for, for more money to, to do that. Um, you know, just some recent, you know, going through recent years of, of what the office has, has collected. Um, in 18... 2018, the office collected a little over two and a half million dollars. In 19, uh, it was over 3.4 million dollars. Uh, 2020, there's still some matters pending. It was a little slower due to COVID, um, but you know there was still uh, you know, Home Depot is one of them that was that was about a hundred thousand dollar settlement. So there was um, there, there's still some activity and something that we do. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty. We're trying to bolster this operation. This is this is something that is a priority of the attorney general. Um, and I would also note that the money is not you know just you know intended for for general fund operations. You know we want to make sure, uh, and our and we believe that we can. But this but this proposal adds some clarifying language around um, the the use of these funds. As as I had mentioned before. You know, making sure an environmental-related settle, settlement can be used towards environmental cleanup, things, things like that. That way we're better you know, mitigating the, uh, the wrongs here. But in, in closing, you know, we ask that you look favorably upon this bill as we believe this will give us the tools to better fight for, for Rhode Islanders uh, and will add uh, much-needed revenue to, to our state. Uh, and with that, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, Ryan, for giving a much better explanation than uh, Gregor Murray would have given. So we really, <laughs> we really appreciate that. For people in the audience, you, he, he's laughing now, but I don't know how I'll have to face his wrath soon. Are there any questions of Ryan at this point, please? Okay, Ryan, it looks like, um, did you provide written testimony also? I, I, I have you here in two different colors. Uh, I just want to make sure. Oh. I want to move no, sure. no, you we did not? did not send in anything uh, okay. written. No, I just, just cause, that's just because you probably called a couple of times. But anyway, I just, I didn't want to miss that. <laughs> I'm persistent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, good for you. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so thanks for your testimony, Ryan. Thank you so much, Chairman. Have a good night. You, you're good. Okay, uh, Rep. Amore, was that okay for you? You... You Chairman, are, I think Ryan did an excellent job. I think he did too. You, you all rep Shanley one. You know that though. Okay. So, okay. Uh, yeah. I know. Randall Rose, are you are you on the line yet? You are, Randall. Hi, Randall. You're on for Bill five eight zero five. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, and I am in support of the bill that Representative Amori and Attorney General Neronia have been um, put have been putting in. I think it's a very good bill. Um, we um, multi-state um, lawsuits are, of course, very very important. Um, a lot of times, they're the only way to go after um, a um, certain kinds of wrongdoing um, to. Um, provide a penalty and discourage certain kinds of wrongdoing. And of course, they also um, have been a very large contributor to um, our state budget, as they have for other states as well. Um, the, um, 
the the tobacco settlement um, the um, is one example. There's there have been many others, of course, um, some of which Mr. Um, Ryan mentioned, um, and. Um, this is one of the um, cases where um, the obligation of the government to pursue justice um, also ends up being a great way to re- raise revenue. Um, so um, it's, um, these are very valuable things, and as um, Mr. Ryan mentioned, um, if, we, um, if Rhode Island um, is able to, um, to contribute more to the litigation, then um, Rhode Island gets correspondingly more in the settlement. Um, and um, from strictly an investment point of view, this makes a lot of sense um, in investment terms um, You um, because um, multi-state lawsuits um, are a proven way to raise revenue and they align with justice. Um, they, are, um, they are also, um, it is worth um, putting more resources in them so that um, the state can benefit more in the future. Um, so I think this is a good bill. Um, the, um, I would mention, um, as, I, um, as the bill is written, it only applies to cases where there's a settlement. Um, I wouldn't mind if it, if it um, also covered cases where there was a trial judgment, um, and um, I wouldn't mind um, also um, in cases where um, the settlement or trial judgment specifies a particular use for the money awarded. Um, I would um, th- um, this this bill as it's currently written. Um, doesn't give anything to the attorney general's office in cases where there's a trial lawsuit or where the settlement specifies a particular use for the money awarded. Um, but I think it would be good policy to expand the bill to cover those cases um, and to provide a certain percentage of matching funds. That is, um, if a settlement or trial judgment um, results in a, a monetary award to the state, um, even if that's a restricted use award, um, a certain percentage of that um, should go to the attorney general's office just because that's a good investment in the long run. Um, but So those would be um, amendments I would suggest to strengthen the bill, but, um, it, um, but even so, I do support the bill as it currently stands. Um, and um, it's, um, this is... Uh, um, this is something that is um, is very important because um, even when um, we're in the right, and these, even when these lawsuits are needed, and um, the um, and um, when um, there's some wrongdoing by the entity being targeted, um, we um, we're not going to win the lawsuit unless we invest money. Um, in um, the attorneys and um, legal costs and other expenses that are needed to win the lawsuit. Um, so I think this is um, a worthwhile bill, um, and um, it's, I, I hope you, that we pass it. And um, it's, um, I know there's always going to be a temptation to scoop money from um, the fund from the attorney general, um, but I think it's worth um, putting, it's worth um, thinking long term on this. Um, don't um, just take money from the attorney general's office to fill a, a one year a budget hole for the current year. Take a think of this as a long term investment that's going to help the state in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Renner. Thanks for your uh, your input for this one. We really appreciate that. Okay, I think that exhausts the list of witnesses uh, from the phone, and uh, we don't have any more. So, if there are no further questions from anyone, that should then end the uh, hearing on 5085. Okay, thank you so much. The next bill we will hear will be 5806 by my good friend, Rep. Shanley. Uh, I, I told Rupa Mori that he owes you one, so don't, don't let him forget it, okay? You're oh, up. At least one. At least one, okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You're on. Thank you, Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, this is a simple piece of legislation that would uh, address a special license plates. So if, if you have a special license plate that's been authorized by statute, currently you have to get 600 sets pre-ordered 
before they will fill the order and print the plates and get them into circulation. The problem is getting to 600 pre-orders has proved to be difficult for some of the organizations that have been approved to get these special plates. And the best way to sell them and to raise money for the causes that they are raising money for is to get them out and get them on the road. So uh, the compromise here uh, is that if you can get 150 sets ordered and come up with a deposit of $3,000 to cover the balance of the 600 sets that need to be produced in order to um, make it so that there's no loss financially for the state, um, you can do that with this legislation. The um, the three thousand the three thousand dollars would be reimbursed to the organization if they were able to get the remaining four hundred and fifty plate sets ordered over a balance of a five year period, uh, and if not, the state would keep the money. So in the past, uh, I had introduced legislation to reduce the number of plates. Um, but the problem was that financially it would cause a loss to the state to incur the cost of producing, say, if it was 150, 300, anything less than 600 would be a loss to the state because that's how they're produced in rolls of 600. So this should eliminate the opposition from a cost perspective because it's cost neutral. It provides a way for these organizations to get the plates printed with a reasonable number of pre-orders and uh, it helps get them on the road so they can sell uh, the remaining plates and raise money for a lot of amazing causes that they uh, exist for. So I'm happy to take any other questions. I know um, John Howell, who represents the Rocky Point organization, and their plate um, is, has done an extensive amount of research on the subject. Um, but I think it's a simple bill. There's, it's cost neutral. And it's going to help a lot of charitable organizations that have been approved for license plates already. So I'd uh, ask for you to consider passing it this year. And happy to take any questions, Chairman. Thank you very much for, uh, for introducing the bill. Are there any questions of the sponsor of the bill at this time? Okay, if not, then we'll go to the phones. And I think we'll get uh, Bud Craddock up first, who is from the, uh, the DMV. Good afternoon, Bud. Are you on? I am Mr. Chairman. How are you? Thank you very much uh, for introducing the bill. I am doing well, thank you. Uh, I think I'm getting some feedback. Uh, do you have your television on? I think you have your television on because I can hear myself. No, I, 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 just, I just lowered it, uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're ready, ready for right. your testimony, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and, and members of the committee. Thank you. Uh, I'm Bud Craddock, the administrator for the Rhode Island Division of Motor Vehicles. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, I, this type of bill comes up every year or two, and uh, I, I have always stepped forward and, and tried to bring a little bit of clarity to it. Uh, while uh, Rep. Shanley has said that he think this is revenue neutral, it actually has a negative impact on the uh, Division of Motor Vehicles in such that while the $3,000 that they are referring to is actually the production cost of the plate, they don't realize that behind the scenes there's about $35,000 of development work for each of these charity plates that has to be put into place. Uh, that includes the development in the rim system. Uh, as you know, we launched RIMS about three years ago. The RIM system has been very successful. Uh, I don't know if you saw the news recently, but we reached 10 million successful transactions. And we've done that because we've been very, very cautious and protective of the, I am sorry, of the way we have been, been able to uh, always make sure that whenever we program the computer, we make sure that we do all appropriate testing to make sure there are no failures or potential breaches of security for the information that we store for our residents. Uh, each plate design has been estimated from the development team to be about 180 hours of development work. That development work includes 
not only identifying the plate in the system, but each plate has to be identified to a particular customer record to make sure that we don't uh, inappropriately charge the wrong person for a plate, and also to make sure that all the appropriate fees flow to the right account so that we can reimburse the charities at a certain date. One of the things that people don't realize is that this does take a lot of time, a lot of work, and I have a limited development team that's on site that's able to maintain the, the rim system and also to do new work that's actually uh, been very beneficial to our citizens with uh, the COVID virus. We've been able to uh, increase the number of transactions that we do online, which we are still trying to do, and also the reservation systems that we're working on to try to make sure that we can keep people out of the building so that not only the customers are safe, but the, the employees are safe so that we can still keep providing the services to our uh, constituency. Uh, I think it's very important that uh, we have charities that want to do this, but we also have to recognize that our goal is to provide service to the greatest number of people that we have in the state, uh, that being the people that uh, are the greatest number. Uh, right now, I will tell you that we have about 30 of the charity plates designed, but only eight have met the minimum. And if we start trying to lower that minimum, we are looking at basically stopping any progress to protect people in the state as we go forward uh, and try to make people do things remotely rather than coming in and being in a congregate setting. Um, I'm here to answer questions if anybody would like to ask any, and uh, I, I hope uh, that this will be uh, in your consideration as you deliberate on this bill. Thank you very much, Bob. We appreciate that. Are there any questions of Mr. Craddock at this point in time? Okay, I think you, you did a good job. They have no question for you at this point in time, but we will keep everything you said uh, in our little pockets here to make sure that as we discuss this, um, we, in, we incorporate some of the thoughts that you had. So it's very much appreciated. Uh, all right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also have submitted a letter on behalf of this and a couple of the other pieces that came forward earlier this evening. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, we have now uh, John Howell. Hi, John, how are you? I'm I'm well. Good. Good to hear that. Are you ready for your brief testimony, sir? I am indeed. Okay. You're on. I'm on. Well, first off, Mr. Chairman and the members of the committee, uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak on behalf of this bill. But before I do that, let me just say, as an observer of government and one who uh, covers the State House on a fairly consistent basis for the Warwick Beacon and Beacon publications. Uh, I'm delighted to see that the process is working and that people are involved and that you're doing uh, our business uh, from, on behalf of the residents of Rhode Island. Um, as for this particular bill, I've submitted some testimony that covers uh, our particular situation in terms of Rocky Point Foundation in an effort to uh, meet the threshold of 600 and the problems we've encountered with that. And I've also included with that a study that was done a couple of years back when this bill was first submitted, uh, taking a look at what's happening in other states and how Rhode Island ranks in terms of uh, difficulty, if you will, in terms of getting these special league plates. Uh, I've also included uh, comments uh, on uh, referencing uh, concerns on the Department of Motor Vehicles and how to handle this if this bill were to, to be passed. And in reference to that, having listened to Mr. Craddock's comments, um, I think if this bill were approved, quite obviously those uh, organizations that are waiting in the wings for their plates would uh, probably meet the 150 threshold and would all be pounding on the door looking for their plates ASAP and quite honestly that would be very difficult 
uh, I believe, for the DMV to handle. So uh, I suggest in, in that letter uh, doing uh, a kind of uh, lottery uh, so that they would even that out. But not mentioned in my written testimony, uh, I just wanted to take a look at this whole plate situation and point out uh, something that I think is obvious to a lot of Rhode Islanders when they look at license plates. Uh, they probably look at that Plum Beach plate and say, what a beautiful plate. And when you look at it, it's one of the first, I believe, in terms of the specialty plates. It is, you know, a lot of them. There are a lot of people that, that have uh, acquired that plate, and the funds from those plates have enabled the restoration of that lighthouse and the continuation of the efforts on the part of those people, which uh, is obviously saving the state funds. And if you look at the six specialty plates that are listed on the DMV website as being available, you'll see a real cross-section of Rhode Island uh, loves, if you will, uh, issues and uh, causes. They are the Gloria Gemma Foundation, the Food Bank, the New England Patriots. How could we not have them on a plate? Uh, the Conservation Through Education Foundation, and the Bristol Fourth of July Parade. Then if you look at those that are, so to speak, in the wings waiting to achieve those numbers, uh, there are a total of nine, and they include the Autism Awareness Foundation, uh, the Boston Bruins, uh, the Boy Scouts, D Strong, Gatsby Days, Providence College, uh, the Rhode Island Day of Portugal, and Saltwater Anglers, and of course the Rocky Point Foundation. The point I'm making here is that this is really a cross-section of Rhode Island. And if you were to just assume that, you know, there may be 300 people that have signed up for each one of these plates, you're looking at you know, 2,700 Rhode Islanders who have paid in excess of $40 for something they haven't gotten and something that they believe in. So I would strongly urge the committee to take a look at <clears throat> lowering this threshold and enabling Rhode Islanders to not only invest in what they believe in but show their pride in the state and show their enthusiasm for such things as, obviously, uh, the Boston Bruins, uh, Rhode Island, I mean, the New England uh, Patriots, and, of course, Rocky Point as well. So I thank you once again, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, look forward to showing my Rhode Island plate, or I should say my Rocky Point plate, and seeing lots of others out there as well. Thank you, John. We appreciate your testimony. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we are dialing up uh, Gina Dooley, I believe. Gina's not available? Greg, okay, let me make sure I take Gina off. Greg, you are available. You're on the line. Hi, Greg. Greg, are you on the line now? I think you should be. I am. Okay, Greg, how are you doing this evening? I'm well, how are you? Okay, ready for your testimony, sir. Okay, um, so I, my name is Craig Garrett. Um, I am looking to move forward the minimum number of plates required for um, custom plates, and my idea would be in the idea of um, cancer plate for uh, childhood cancer. Um, I am... 45 years old. In 2017, I was diagnosed with a childhood cancer. And um, as, I, as I dissected this cancer and wrapped my head around it, um, I began to understand that childhood cancer is 
um, is grossly underfunded. Um, the National Cancer Institute every year a lot, just under 4%, it's like 3.9% um, to the annual research budget, which if you've ever spent any time um, with somebody that has childhood cancer, um, being a relative or, you know, we've all seen the Jimmy Fund, we've all seen the commercials on TV, but I've spent time um, with some very good people that um, were taken by an ugly disease. Um, moving forward with that, I have three children. I couldn't imagine one of them um, being diagnosed with any kind of cancer. So with this bill, this will help us move forward with the possibility of gaining some plates, much like the breast cancer ones we see on the road every day, um, and possibly bring awareness to something that is um, just a, a, a something that gets swept under the rug. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, moving forward, I'd, I'd like to see this bill passed. Thank, thank you very much for your comments and your testimony. Uh, any questions of the, uh, the respondent? Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, sir. Uh, I believe we have coming up now uh, Richard Hittinger. Hey, Richard. Yes. You're on, sir. This is Chairman Abney at the House Finance Committee. Oh, thank you very much, and good evening, everyone. Uh, obviously, this is very different, just as many things are very different in this time of COVID than what I'm used to. Uh, but anyway, my name is Richard Hittinger, and I'm the first vice president of Rhode Island Saltwater Anglers Association. Uh, and I'm here in, uh, uh, to speak in favor of the proposed bill H. 5806. Um, we have a 501c3 foundation, and that foundation has been actively helping children in Rhode Island, um, providing educational experiences for adults, and we've been providing funds for research that's critical to improving recreational fishing in Rhode Island. Some of the programs that we have supported without any state funding include construction of an artificial reef near Sabin Point in Riverside, construction of fish ladders to allow fish passage in some of Rhode Island rivers, um, salt marsh restoration projects. Uh, we sponsor a biannual symposium uh, to bring experts in recreational fishing together, including uh, experts from the state of Rhode Island and the state of Massachusetts. Uh, and other locations around the country. Uh, we have a Take a Kid Fishing Day in June uh, for the past 20 years where about 100 mostly inner city kids get a chance to go out and fish on one of our members' boats and catch fish in Greenwich Bay. Uh, they have the time of their life. Uh, we also sponsor a fishing camp with the cooperation of Rhode Island DEM at Rocky Point uh, every year. Now, some of these things actually have had to be postponed because of the pandemic. Um, but uh, we rely on donations to our foundation uh, to support these activities. And we look forward to getting our license plate program up and running. Uh, and we have an approved license plate design, and we've been taking orders for some time, but we're finding that it's nearly impossible to reach out and get 600 people who are willing to place their order, uh, to write the check, and then to wait an unknown amount of time before they'll actually get their plate. Uh, if this bill passes, we're willing to put up the $3,000 and submit the 150 completed applications. Uh, and we believe that once the plate is on the streets, uh, we've had a lot of people who say that they would get it. So we think we will reach the 600 plate target and, and recover the $3,000. And I thank you very much uh, for allowing me the opportunity this evening to speak. Well, thanks for all the work that you do with the children that you work with. It's much, much appreciated. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Okay, great. Uh, what I'm gonna do now is a little bit uh, unusual, but as I said before, the sponsor of the bill, we try to make sure they, they get a pretty good chance to 
to explain what they need. And, and Rep. Shamley, did you have just a couple of remarks to make? Uh, remember, it's not a debate with anyone, but if, you, if there's some sure. clarification on your bill that you wanted to make, you can do that at this point. Yes, just very briefly, Chairman, thank you. Uh, when Director Craddock was on, he indicated that it would cost an additional $35,000 to actually design the plate. So first of all, that cost is going to be borne whether or not we have it at 150 or 600. So that should be part of any debate as to whether we approve any future license plates. Second, he indicated it was $35,000 because it was 180 man hours. I find it a little hard to believe that it's 180 man hours to design one license plate. And even if it is 180 man hours, the math comes out to we're paying somebody about $280 or $200 an hour to produce that. So I'm not sure the numbers add up there. Maybe Director Craddock has some more information on how those numbers align. Um, but just looking at it objectively, it doesn't seem to add up or make sense. And, and maybe we're paying too much to design these plates and doing it the wrong way if that's what we're paying. I just wanted to throw that in there and add it in. Thank you, Chairman, for indulging me. Okay, thank you very much. That's, that's why, as I said at the beginning, we hold a bill for further study because many times there are adjustments that are made and re uh, other research is done. But if there are no further questions of the sponsor, I do want to go on record by saying that I have um, 30, a, a list of 30 people who you can find this online uh, who written, gave written testimony in support uh, of the bill. So if you want to go online to see who's supporting, there are 30 members who are in support of that. So uh, if there are no further questions, then I'm... No, we're not going to debate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so that'll end the hearing at this point on Bill 5806. Okay. All right, right, thank you very much. Okay. The next we will do then, I, I believe that exhausts the uh, reps who had bills uh, that weren't here, that were remote, uh, and then it's just the rest of us here that have bills. That's what I was trying to accomplish the first time around. So he's been patiently waiting with two bills. Rep Nardone, you want to put yours into place, sir, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, can I take Bill 5529 first? Yes, you can. Okay. Right now, right now, as it stands, um, DOT, when they, when they uh, put a highway in, they're in charge of the maintenance of the roads that they install. And they also install the, um, the walkway and the sidewalks. And that... Um, that's mandated onto the municipalities to, to, to take care of. And uh, this bill was brought to my attention by my uh, DPW uh, manager in my town. And um, he, he just f found that to be a little unreasonable. And so he asked me to present this bill. And um, I somewhat agree with it. When you look at all the money the uh, DOT gets through tolls, uh, federal funding through the gas tax, and um, I know they've got a big bond issue coming up with that. that I imagine that will go through. Um, I think uh, what, what we're asking is that the, uh, the DOT actually take care of the maintenance of the highway, that's um, the sidewalks that they install, as they do with the highways and the roadways that they, uh, they install. So that's the ask. And I don't know if my uh, DPW worker, he said he was going to call in. I don't know if he's on... We will see. Okay. We have uh, we have Timothy uh, Zaglio and Christopher DeCiso. Uh So I think we're going to have Timothy up on the line first. Timothy is unavailable. Okay. Was Timothy your guy? No. No. Okay. It would be Kevin <laughs> McGee. Is there a Kevin McGee on there? Well, he said he. Okay. We're trying to get Timothy at one of his. Okay. It looks like Christopher is uh, unavailable. Also, uh, Rep. Edwards. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I know in Tiverton we have a lot of sidewalks that are 
they were all put in by the state. So I can imagine there are miles and miles and miles of sidewalks throughout the state that this would pertain to. So what is what are you proposing to have the the, the state go out there with those like bobcats or those small sidewalk cleaners and run throughout the state? Uh, uh, and keeping, you know, just, keeping just the snow, I mean, just the snow portion of the maintenance would be, um, I mean, it would be incredibly difficult. Um, and I don't, I don't, I can't imagine the state would have the money to go out there and take and maintain during a snowstorm all of the sidewalks that they supposedly own throughout the state. Right. Um, I, th I think the, the maintenance as far as snow remo removal and that would be on the, the um, would be on the town. I think this, I believe this is just for like the maintenance, like what happens is if, if a root if a root grows on, on the tree and lifts up the sidewalk, it's that kind of structural maintenance, I believe is what my DPW um, manager was referring to. As far as like when, I, I have sidewalks in front of my house, uh, the, the town doesn't come out and shovel them. I have to. I have to clear the snow, and I think that would apply as well on this too. I think the town would still be responsible for removal of snow. It's more the structural maintenance. Well, and if that's this, the way this reads, Rep, it would it would require the state to go out there and remove snow, okay, um, or to clean the sidewalks or any kind of maintenance at all. All right. So, so, so I would allude to what the chairman said that. Uh, this is this bill is just up there. I mean, any way we can tighten it up, we we'll tighten it up. Um, so it's just it's it opens a conversation. So. Thank you, Chairman. Right. Thank you both. I appreciate that. Okay, looks like we couldn't get a hold of the uh, the two other witnesses on the phone, but that's okay. Uh, if are there any further questions of uh, Rep. Nardone on that? I do have uh, two. I think these are um, written. Testimony, Eric uh, Skadberg and Patricia Robb, I believe, uh, sent letters of uh, support in. I, I think it does. Uh, is that, that correct, uh, Chris, the little support for these two? Okay, I think so. All right, great. So we put that in for the record. Uh, if no other questions, then the hearing on 5529 should conclude. Okay, then the next bill you have is 5531. Is that on the same number? Yes, yep, that Thank is. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Okay, um, and this bill, I should say, there's going to be a sub A to include uh, fire personnel as well. Uh, two years ago, we passed a bill, and um, it stated that uh, we have to op have a restricted receipt account for uh, 911 fees. 50 cents on every phone bill would go into that account. And what this legislation, what I'm asking for this legislation is to do is to take 25 cents of that, 50 cents, and put it into an account where uh, municipalities can come in and use those funds to shore up their 911 infrastructure. Uh, this would be a one-time thing. It would run for the year of 2022, and I think it would be very beneficial. Um, I know a lot of municipalities are having trouble keep getting their infrastructure straightened out with that, mine being one of them. So okay, thank you very much. Any questions uh, of the sponsor of that bill, please? <laughs> okay. <laughs> They'll question you sooner or later. <laughs> okay. So then that will end the hearing on your bill on that one. Um, let's see. I just want to check in. We have a bill, 5538 uh, by Rep Perez. Uh, I don't know that he's on the line, um, I mean, on the, uh, the tube or not, but I just want to read it into the record just in case. Uh, this is Bill 5538 by Rep Perez, and it amends the fine for a first offense for failure to have motor vehicle insurance to a maximum of $125. It amends the fine for a first offense for failure to have motor vehicle insurance to a maximum of $125. Uh, he's not here, uh, but it's read into the record. Does anybody have any questions for him that we might can get to him? If not, we can al always uh, call him in and see what he, he has on that bill. Okay, if not, then that should end the hearing on Bill uh, 553 by Rep. Perez. Okay. 
Then I'll go toward the front. Then we have, well, we have one other bill, uh, 5231 uh, three, by someone named Shikarchi. I think it's our uh, House Speaker, Speaker Shikarchi's bill. It provides technical amendments to the existing pass-through entity uh, election tax statute. It provides technical amendments to the existing pass-through entity election tax statutes and would have no uh, physical impact. So that's Bill 5231. Any questions for the uh, speaker on that that I might be able to get to him? Okay, great. If not, then that will end the hearing uh, on Bill 5231. All right. Then the next bill would be Bill 5530 by uh, Rep. Bella Wilkinson. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So uh, no, um, no, 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 uh, Mr. 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 Chairman, oh, um, yeah. I just promoted you, Chairman. <laughs> you, you just said I have, I have uh, <laughs> Speaker Shikarchi on the brain. Yeah. I uh, know. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. He's on my mind too. So yeah. I know. <laughs> and members of the Finance Committee, um, House Bill five five three zero is an act relating to TF Green Airport, and I know that we had heard a similar bill that was sponsored by uh, Chairman McNamara, um, I think it was last week, with regards to the same situation. And I had asked a question of the person that was testifying on behalf of TF Green Airport. I don't know whether or not he had decided that he was going to call in tonight. Has he? I, I don't know. Yeah, just no one called in on this no bill. So you, you All know. right, so let me just... Let me just put this to the record, though, uh, okay. for you, Bill. Uh, uh, Kevin Michaud uh, uh, sent in uh, written testimony that's opposed to it. Okay. Okay, just one Thank for you. the record. Continue, so please. Just to put this, just to put this bill into, uh, to frame the issue, the, the city of Warwick has a donut hole, which is the airport right in its center in the northern end of the city. And... In addition to the fact that it has taken a sizable chunk of affordable housing permanently off the tax rolls for the city, it has also acquired quite a number of commercial properties. And some of the properties that it has taken over, they're not using it. So it's not as if they, it's, it was set aside for airport use. At one point, the airport at one point, the airport had decided that they wanted to expand, and they were looking at expanding across um, across um, Airport Road and also across Main Avenue. And the FAA came back and allowed them to expand uh, uh, across Main Avenue, but not Airport Road. But in anticipation of being allowed to take off, take a portion of Airport Road, they took over a few different commercial properties, including one very popular restaurant that was on Post Road because they thought that they would use that as an access point to the airport. That never materialized, and the airport had promised over and over again since I was on the city council that they were going to return that, that restaurant. It was actually the, the Atwood Grill, um, they were going to return the property to the tax rolls, and it's still vacant. If you go by there today, you'll still see the, uh, the, the, the fence around the property. The, the city cannot continue to lose its base, and then on top of that, be providing city services to the airport without the appropriate remuneration. Now, I know that the gentleman, and I don't recall his name, I'm sorry, had testified last week that the FAA um, precludes them from diverting revenue for anything that's other than um, aviation purposes. Fine. But the city has to purchase have heavy equipment, and the city has to uh, purchase computers and office furniture and, um, and vehicles. And the airport purchases heavy equipment and vehicles. And so there isn't anything, to the best of my research, that would preclude them from engaging in cost aversion techniques for the city of Warwick. So 
Mr. Chairman, if the RIAC is not going to support the host community by paying their fair share of the property taxes, then at least they could help the residents in the city of Warwick by reducing our tax burden and them engaging in cost-saving measures to the benefit of the city of Warwick. That's my bill in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you so much. I can tell you've served on the city council and now in the state, so we have a, a good idea of what you're talking about on that one. I appreciate that uh, very much. Are there any questions of the sponsor, please? Okay. If not, then that will uh, end the hearing on Bill 5530. Okay. Then the next bill we'll be here, I'm in order now, those of you, is 5541 by Rep. Tabone. Uh, 5541. Thank you, Chairman. So this one I've put in uh, for the last few years. It was at the bequest of the uh, Secretary of State. And basically this is not a new fee. When anyone's going to do any business in Rhode Island, there's a fee involved. And there's this whole complex formula to derive at that fee. 99% of the times, it ends up being $160, with the exception of one time, which I think it was Citizens Bank, which was greater. Now, the reason uh, this pretty much came to light was a few years back when uh, Jack Black was filming here, the Polka King, um, he, was, he went through the process and they started asking him for a ton, uh, uh, all of his personal information. And he had not only not gone through that elsewhere, he didn't feel it was necessary for him to put his personal information out there for others to see. So he made a big stink about it. And when the Secretary of State's office looked further into it, they realized that, again, 99% of the times, everyone who does business in Rhode Island uh, of that nature or any nature, uh, outside entity pays $160. So this is just to streamline the process and just make it $160. It's not a new fee. It's, it's an expected fee. And uh, she just wants to simplify. So that's, that's all it is. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And, and I do have uh, a, a letter in support uh, from Secretary of State uh, Nella Gobert, who supports this, uh, for the record. Are there any questions of the sponsor, please? Of, uh, of that bill. If not, then that'll end the hearing on Bill H5541. The next bill we will hear will be from the gentleman to my left, your right, Bill 5799, uh, Vice Chair Mazelkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 5799 um, came to me from a constituent, and it just basically streamlines the registration fee for camping RVs. Short and sweet. Does anyone have any questions of that short and sweet bill? That's, that's a good one. Thank you for putting it in, appreciate that. Uh, so that then would end the hearing on Bill 5799. Okay. I'm trying to make sure I did not run out of bills, which I believe we've gotten all the bills. I appreciate your attendance tonight. If there are no further questions, that should end the business of the Finance Committee. Thank you very much.